Next up, we have Christina Collins, KD8OXT. Title of her talk is The Lion and the Propagation Path of WWV and the Standard Station Receiver. Thank you. All right, very pleased to be here. And thank you to, uh, to Tapper for supporting our attendance. I'm here with a couple other members from the Case Club, Skylar KD9JPX and Rob AC8YV. And uh, first I want to address my talk title here because when Scotty and Steven reached out to me and asked me to give a talk, I went with an old bit of advice that's something of a running joke in our club, uh, which comes from the lore of various universities and I haven't been able to pin it down to a single origin. But the advice is essentially when you are asked to give a talk and you don't yet know what the talk will be on and you are asked to give a title, you should call it the lion in the path because it sounds very dramatic and it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> and so when they asked me for, you know, and this is something where I've given several talks titled the lion in the path and the guy that I heard this story from had heard it from his advisor and then he looked up his advisor's CV and his advisor had given something like 50 talks titled the lion in the path. So, but anyway, so, um, then when they asked me for an updated title, and I had decided that I would talk about the, uh, the standard station receiver, which is this project that some folks at CASE had been working on, I got to thinking about it, and I decided to keep the, the basics of that title, because in fact, we have WWV, and we have our ground station, or your ground station, or anyone's ground station. In between, in fact, there is a propagation path, and we are trying to figure out what manner of lions and tigers and bears are on that propagation path. So I do need to put in a disclaimer here in keeping with the wildlife theme. It is David Kasdan and John Gibbons, who some of you may remember from, uh, from Hamasai presentations last year, and Matt McConnell, uh, if you remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, I'm Marlin and they're Jim. They're, you know what I'm talking about, they're downriver, you know, with the vicious crocodile and I'm watching through the high-powered binoculars. I am relatively new to this project, so I'm going to explain it as best I can and I hope we'll have good conversations after. But I am still learning and I'm still building my knowledge of it. So, having said that, a, uh, a hello from WADDU. Uh, you may remember us as the folks that brought you Hamsai 2019 in Cleveland. And we are delighted to be back again with many people from, uh, from that conference. Here's a little shot of our station, and you can't really see it in this picture, but just outside the frame up to the left there is one of the little prototype space weather stations that I'm going to be telling you about, uh, and that we have a working-ish prototype of in the next room, although our antenna is not cooperating yet. So the first thing that I want to clarify is that the standard station receiver is a distinct project from the Tangerine SDR. It is a, uh, a more specific mandate, and above all, it is low cost. Our goal is to use the standard station WWV and other standard stations to be able to get Doppler measurements over time and to keep it as cheap as possible. And our target audience is all hams and particularly educational institutions. We want something that is very plug and play. So we're doing everything that we can to, uh, to keep that as sort of our highest objective. So I'm gonna step through uh, this discussion of the standard station receiver, which was written by the team, but particularly Dr. Frisell. Um, the, uh, the core of it is this little board that is itself a radio receiver optimized for picking up WWV and other standard stations. Uh, we're listening to WWV and CHU. CHU is the Canadian standard station, and I want to point out, as was pointed out earlier, they keep their standard time frequencies right next to the ham bands because they know that the ham radio operators will want to use them. The United States took all the nice numbers <laughs> because they got there first. So, uh, 
so our goal is to measure the, uh, the frequency shifts between what we are hearing and what our local oscillator is telling us we're hearing, and we're using a GPSDO to get us that local oscillator. Ultimately, we plan to be listening to all of the signals. At the moment, we are only a single channel. We're listening to one at a time. And then one of the things that we're trying to make sure that we have our infrastructure in place for is the recording of that data, the storage of that data, the visualization of that data in a way that is maximally compatible with all of the other projects that are happening in this particular space. And to make it as easy as possible to, uh, to correlate and to do math where you are getting to get to the interesting parts and not having to fight with how it is recorded. So, again, our key points that we are pushing for are that it will be robust and that, above all, it will be low cost. So the, uh, the goals for our prototype are, well, first, there's a simple wire antenna. We have one. Yes, I'm pleased to announce. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's a GPSDO that is providing the main um, clock for it. And right now it's built around a Raspberry Pi or it will be some other similar low-cost uh, small computer. And then we have work that we're doing on optimizing the frequency estimation problem. So at present, it's built around the FLDigi analysis module, which you can find in FLDigi if you just plug your radio into your computer as you are used to doing, and you go to frequency analysis mode, uh, and you just sit a kilohertz off from WWV, you'll be able to record a file, much like the kind that we're working with. And we have a few scripts that make that a little bit easier that we're working on that do things like label the data and make the data pedigree a little bit clearer. But in general, this is based on some things that already exist, and we're working on refining that. So a brief recap of how the Doppler shift measurement works. Again, we have our two stations and some fixed distance between the two of them. And if there is no particular change in the, uh, the length of the propagation path, then we won't see any change in the frequency. But generally, we have this relatively simple process, or at least it seems relatively simple at first glance, which is that we estimate the incoming frequency. We subtract it from the nominal frequency, which, because it's W8EDU, is some number 0.00000. We take that distance, difference, we report it as the Doppler shift, and then from that we say, okay, well, if it stays the same, then the path length stays the same, and if it changes, then that reflects a change in the path length. And the difficult part of this problem, the part that we are working on and will continue to be working on, is all buried in item one there, which is the bit where it says estimate the incoming frequency, because getting that to a very precise estimation is a, uh, a challenging problem. And I won't be talking about it a whole ton today, but I think that we'll have some good stuff for you guys uh, as more conferences are coming up. So, whoops. You may have seen some of the preliminary data uh, at previous conferences and things. A lot of it is up on the HamSci website. Um, but this is just one of the early bits of data that we had that shows sunrise very clearly when you're just listening to WWV. So I want to talk a little bit about WWV, which is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary. And there's going to be a ham radio special event station for it, uh, which we'll be talking about. And I know I have a great fondness for it. Uh, the general line is that it is the heartbeat of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it shows up on 2.5, 5, 10, 15, 20, and sometimes 25 uh, megahertz. And uh, again, all the nice numbers. So this is part, of course, of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has kind of an interesting history. Uh, was started in the uh, turn of the century, I think 1901, I want to say, is the, uh, the National Bureau of Standards. And they have quite a number of mandates in terms of things that they need to standardize. They, uh, they do all sorts of things with time, but of course, as everyone knows, they are responsible for the kilogram. And uh, they are responsible for things like standards in chemicals, fire retardants, and of course, peanut butter. Uh, I've been told it doesn't taste very good. I don't know if they, they should just like sell jars of it and things. Um, so, 
if you go back and you want to find the first points when we talk about standards in American history, in the Articles of Confederation, the power to assess standards in weights and measures is assigned to the states. This was a terrible idea because New Hampshire and Connecticut couldn't agree on how many pounds were in a bushel. And, one of them, and so you could take things just across the state line and then you could resell them and it was a totally different, it was madness. And so uh, George Washington, at least his first two State of the Union addresses, is like, we have to get on this, we have to figure out national weights and measures. And there was a uh, sort of a mandate for that that nobody really acted on for quite a long time. There was some movement in the 1800s and then the National Bureau of Standards, when it was founded, kind of cleaned a lot of that up. Now, uh, Washington, this is kind of an interesting story. Washington assigned Jefferson to work on a uh, metrification effort. And Jefferson wrote the Jefferson Report of 1790. And one of the things that happened was he asked this fellow, Joseph Dombey, who was a fantastic botanist and a really unlucky man, for reasons which will become clear, to go to France and come back with a kilogram and a meter stick. And so Joseph Dombey went to France and he picked up a kilogram and a meter stick and on his way back, he stopped on an island to do some botany because he was a very good botanist. And his ship was commandeered by pirates who stole the kilogram and the meter stick. And that is how close we came to being a metric nation. <laughs> the first time, I'm not gonna get into Reagan. Um, so Jefferson's method, as proposed in the Jefferson Report, for talking about time, to the extent that anybody really needed to, because it was sort of like, eh, is it noon? I don't know. You know, they weren't really thinking about their radio standards uh, in, the, in 1790, but they had this idea that you would have this two-second pendulum, and he worked out that there were certain things where it was going to matter, you know, obviously it mattered the length of it, and he said, we'll use a rigid rod, and he spells all of this out, uh, and, you know, what latitude you do it at, and so forth, and he based a few things around that. Um, when NIST defines the second as a function of the number of ticks of a cesium clock, that's actually an unusual thing in human history, because that's the first time that it isn't based on some astronomical standard. Because here we have somebody in, uh, in Greenwich taking the transit to be able to figure out the length of a day and then dividing that down to get what a second is. And it's really not the same animal. So now, of course, we have all of these different versions of universal time, our favorite of which is coordinated universal time with its confusing acronym. And then you have this question of, okay, well, now we have a time standard, but how do we disseminate the time standard? And we have these wonderful little atomic clocks now. Of course, the older solutions were things like you would have bells and so forth. This is a fun little device. This is a meridian cannon. You ever seen one of these? You have a powder charge and a magnifying glass. <laughs> and when it's noon, you know. <laughs> And again, safe in Cleveland, because there's no sun. Um, so, all right, so then radio happened. And uh, here we are at the end of World War I, and the, uh, the Bureau of Standards has got their radio laboratory. Um, and there's a nice big slice of the pie in there for amateurs, which those in the front should be able to see at least. Um, and this was recognized as being a public good, partly because they were doing these wonderful early experiments in music broadcasting. And this was before, by a span of months, but this was before anybody was doing commercial broadcasting of music. And here's this fantastic line from one of their press releases about the, uh, the experimental Friday evening concerts. This means that music can be performed at any place, radiated into the air by means of an ordinary radio set, and received at any other place, even though hundreds of miles away. Wow! The pleasant evenings, which have been experienced by persons at a number of such receiving stations, suggest interesting possibilities of the future. Isn't that just the most charming little thing? All right. So that's WWV when it, was in, uh, when it was in D.C. 
And they started out with their, uh, their court's time base and started doing ticks in 1937. And uh, they have evolved from our original humble seconds pendulum that uh, Jefferson came up with. In 1948, we see the opening of radio station WWVH, which is in Hawaii and does almost the same thing with a few variations. And from what I've heard, it's a place filled with many happy engineers and a lot of copper. So there's one of their loading coils. And there's uh, some of the frequency counters on their cesium fountain. So they have a bunch of different clocks and they're all in a voting system so that you can be very extra sure. And we're not alone, as mentioned, about CHU and having time frequency stations. Here is by no means a complete list of some other countries that have them. And some of these have really amazing names. China got BPM. Isn't that great? Uh, Argentina has LOL. <laughs> but the greatest of these is ESPU Finland. Ta-da! They have a CB radio with a quarter wave whip antenna and they plugged a cesium clock into it and that's their national frequency standard. <laughs> so, also just, this will never be useful information to you. The, the official animal of ESPU is the Siberian flying squirrel. It is, uh, it is the, considered one of the priority endangered species in Finland. Uh, we want to visit them. Interestingly, WWV is very careful with their 25 megahertz transmitter because they don't want to, and this is a direct quote, they don't want to be the ugly Americans and step on Finland. So, plus they have these wonderful little houses at their, uh, this is from the Museum of Modern Art in Espoo, and it needs a ham antenna. All right, so back to WWV. So here's their antennae, and here's WWVH in Hawaii. And so if we look at the broadcast format, because the question is, okay, we have this wonderful standard, and it's giving us these ticks, and it's giving us these other sorts of ticks, and they're all layered on top of each other. How do we extricate information from this in a way that is useful to us? And again, how do we do it in a way that is very low cost and that is compatible with citizen science and so forth? Um, again, WWV and WWVH are very similar. If you look up in the corner where they have kind of that breakout, you'll notice that we have the, uh, a different order of tones, depending on what minute it is. Here's a table of how they do the audio tones. So, since they're on the same carrier frequencies, the audio tones give you one way to figure out which station is which beyond just listening to the carrier frequency. Because otherwise, they're singing the same tune at the same time. You're not going to be able to differentiate. And then they also have the, uh, the time code format. And let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, yes. This is the radio control clock in my living room. Can you see what it's doing? Maybe in the front there? It is very fast. It's turning very fast. You get it? Daylight saving time. I, for some reason, I am always in my living room between two and three. Like, I never plan this, but I'm always like, oh, the clock's going really fast. Uh, and if you have one of these, which they're wonderful little things, because especially if you're close to a repeater for one of these time codes, as I am, you never need to think about it. Um, the, uh, when you are springing forward, as you would expect, you know, it sort of does this turning very fast thing for an hour. When you are falling back, it does this turning very fast thing for an hour 11 times. Because it can only go one way. <laughs> so if you ever want to feel sorry for a clock. Okay, uh, anyway, so you have this time code format, and there's a few, you know, there's a few bits in this that get mixed around depending on uh, station. There's a couple of different forms of it. But in general, it, it's more or less like this. And so that's something that we can listen to. That's something where we, uh, we more or less know what second it is, hopefully, and we can more or less figure out what the next second is going to be. So here's a, a, just a run-through of a few different measurement approaches that are available to us. And again, this is an open question. This is something that we're continuing to investigate the best ways to tackle this problem while remaining within the engineering constraints that we've set for ourselves. So again, the carrier, on the one hand, very straightforward, 
because you're just listening for this signal. On the other hand, there's a lot of, uh, of 10 megahertz floating around the average ham shack. So, you know, that may not be the only thing that you want to do. Uh, second ticks, we could do a time of flight thing, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, but that's going to require a little more uh, information than we presently can get out of our GPSDO. The tones and the audio sideband uh, let you distinguish between WWV and WWVH, but they're only available intermittently. And then you could use this digital time code with a matched filter where you aren't doing it causally, but you're recording a minute, putting that minute's data in buffer, and then going back and comparing. So that's another option. A couple of links here. This is the same thing I was talking about, the frequency estimation thing um, with the Doppler measurement. So the one on the top there is the presentation from HamSci back in March that was what the team had been up to then. And they've got a few illustrative examples. And then this second one is for, again, WWV coming up on its 100th anniversary, uh, how to do the frequency measurement for that. So. Then here's the time of flight approach that we're talking about, uh, where we have these pulses that are specific to WWV or WWVH. We have either, let's see, five cycles of a kilohertz or six of 1.2. And it's hard to figure out exactly when that starts, but if you listen to the whole thing and then you go back, you should be able to suss out when it starts. So this is something where we could be using a one pulse per second signal out of the, uh, the GPSDO that we're using. So to talk a little bit about the, uh, I've heard it called the, the meta instrument, um, the idea of having all of these stations, how do we get that data collected? Uh, CASE has a, an institute for Internet of Things, and they have some infrastructure that we're talking about using for this. So the first step, we have our collection. We have many of these nodes, where each of these nodes is one of our receivers. And they are doing, I am told this is a term of art, edge processing, where they are doing the processing at that layer rather than taking in all of the data and then post-processing it later. So then that would go into storage. And then we have our analysis step where we do the computations, put things into our database, and then have a front end. that We've got some senior project students right now. We're starting to nibble at this problem of how do we take this and make it something that can easily be visualized and used. So that's the first pass at the information architecture that we're building around getting the data out of this army of small instruments. Here's the general block diagram of the little board that's in the other room, which hopefully all of you will meet. Um, and we have the antenna, and then we have the GPSDO sending both signals into a mixer, and then the output of that goes through a gain stage into the sound card of a Raspberry Pi. And that, again, is just the same as when you take your radio and you plug it into your computer and you use FL Digi. The GPSDO that we've been using is the Leo Bodnar Mini GPSDO, which is a nice little device. It is the least expensive programmable GPSDO we were able to find. Uh, the independent measurements of it are very good. And ultimately, what we plan to do in order to measure all of those frequencies at once is to use the output of this to drive a digital synthesis chip so that we can have more local oscillator frequencies. My one concern is that most of the digital synthesis chips, I think, only have eight channels, and we need to measure nine stations. So we'll have to figure that out. At the moment, the only, in, the only output that we get from the GPSDO is the frequency itself, that clock frequency. Ultimately, we would like to be able to get the GPS position, uh, the UTC timestamp, and again, that pulse per second signal so that we could do the time of flight measurements. Uh, and we are told that the position and timestamp will be coming in an upcoming firmware update. So we will let you know how that part goes and uh, what we do for, the, um, for our GPSDO solutions. Uh, I do recommend it if you are looking for a GPSDO for home projects. It's at a good price point. It's a nice little device. You plug it in and it just goes. So here's the, uh, the board for the standard station receiver. And we'll just take a, uh, a quick walk along this together. So we have our basic things, our input power, our antenna and GPSDO inputs. And again, this goes to the analog output to the sound card. Then we have some housekeeping items. 
our 5 volt power supply. We, uh, mine's running off of a 9 volt battery right now, so we regulate that to something we can use. We have a power indicator light because we're not heathens. Uh, we have lightning protection and then a bleed resistor for static. Uh, the input filter right now is selectable between um, 2.55 and 10 megahertz. And you change which one of those it is by moving a little jumper on the board. So in order to change it, you change the jumper, you change the frequency in FL Digi, and you uh, change the frequency on the GPSDO. So at the moment, it's a multi-step process, but as the project evolves, that'll smooth out. There's the mixer chip, and then uh, that goes to the differential gain stage, which bumps it up by 22 decibels. So the next steps for us, as I've mentioned, more channels. Right now, we only have a single channel of data, and we're looking at what frequency estimation algorithms we might want to use, because one option is that we could just do an FFT for the whole thing. We've been talking a little bit about using a Gertzel algorithm, uh, which is the rather elegant solution that IBM and Bell Labs came up with for detecting uh, touch tone sounds in, the, um, in band when in a computation-constrained environment, because the FFT is efficient beyond a certain point. So it may be that we hit a sweet spot. We're not sure yet. Um, another thing is that we may wind up going in the direction of an FPGA, but all of this is still up in the air. As I mentioned, we're trying to get more data out of the GPSDO that we have, and then we're trying to make our software work, uh, which includes making sure that the updating for it uh, is smooth and does not update halfway, and then also the storage of data being compatible with things, and potentially the ability to have a station that isn't connected to the internet record its data, say, to an SD card or some other medium, and then integrate that into things later. And then, of course, the, uh, the other thing that we really need to do is make sure that the entire system is documented and get that all figured out so that there is a manual for people to read. So, with that, here's a picture of the board itself, and I would like to uh, express our thanks, regards, and kudos to uh, David Kasdan, 88Y, John Gibbons, N8OBJ, and Matt McConnell, KC8AWM, who are the ones who are really doing a lot of the work on this project so far. And again, many thanks to Tapper for supporting our attendance here. Now, I do have, again, one other plug for WWV100 here. We have the Festival of Frequency Measurement coming up. And, oh, this is for real. Uh, several of us are going to Colorado. Let's see, is it next week or is it the week after? It, it's the last weekend in September. It's the week after. Um, so if you, if you have the ability to travel to Colorado to hang out and go to a ham station, it's probably going to be pretty fun. If you don't, get on the air and, uh, and talk to us, because we'll be running a whole bunch of transmitters under the special event call sign WW0WWV. And uh, we'll be doing frequency measurement. So if you go to WWV100.org, there will be data on there on how to do that. And I'm just going to play this for you, and hopefully the audio will work. Yeah. Try it. Coordinated universal time. The Department of Defense congratulates WWV on 100 years of service to the nation, broadcasting standard time and other critical information. An amateur radio special event station, WW0WWV, will celebrate the anniversary on air from September 28th to October 2nd. Please visit www100.com for more information. Please go to www.dodmars.org to take a listener survey. I think that's running, I want to say, 10 past the hour every hour now, which is just delightful. So 
check it out and join us on the air, and it should be a lovely time. Uh, did they say .com? I think either one will get you there. He said .com. Trust him. He's on WWV. <laughs> All right, and with that, I believe we are just about on to playtime. Just about, but first yeah. let's have some questions. Oh, boy. Hey, Christina, this is really cool stuff, uh, but one, and there's a number of things I'd like to talk to you about, but one idea is uh, for your synthesizer, generate 2.5 megs and filter out the harmonics, and that'll give you every, all the WWV frequencies from one source, so that'll be one yeah, super dirty thought. way to get that to work. Uh, didn't they have a 60 kilohertz standard, and did I recently hear that that went away? No? Is there something that did? Uh, have you developed yet the a standard protocol for the communication the, uh, over the internet uh, from the receiver unit to, uh, I guess, your Amazon Web Service database? Because I need to get with you about that so we can try and commonize on something with the tangerine. That's one of the reasons we're here, because we want to talk to you about it. Um, I don't the short answer is no, not yet. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's something that uh, is in the list of next steps. Um, I have not spent a bunch of time in that part of the project, but we will talk about it and I will put you in, charge with, in touch with Matt because that is his wheelhouse right now. Okay, we'll get together after the... After yeah, for this. sure. Other questions? Do you have any feel for whether your single Raspberry Pi will be able to process all nine channels at the same time when you get to that point? Um, like compa compared to the, the code load that it's running now to right. one channel? Maybe? I don't know yet. That's, we have to do the math. But that, that is the next question, so it's the right question to be asking, is whether it can. And if it can, I think that it's a good platform. And if it can't, we'll find something else. Any other questions? Okay, in the back here. Why don't you just use a shift register? Sorry? I said, why don't you just, just use a shift register? Like they do on the Arduino to get extra input. Oh, in terms of uh, buffering a minute of data? Yeah, that's what you'd do. That's one option. I don't know um, if we're planning on, we're, we're still trying to figure out which parts of the problem we might want to do causally or non-causally. Because if we do the Gertzel algorithm, then that could be causal. If we do a matched filter, then that would be non-causal, in which case, yeah, we would be buffering it as you describe. So, yep. Okay, other questions? Big round of applause. Thank you.